I've been thinking, I have a theory that when black culture shifted, it shifted because of the music shifting. Because I was going back to Dana Dane, Big Daddy Kane, no half stepping, and I noticed that these rappers wore suits. And you could still, right now, listen to the songs they created in the 80s with your grandmother in the room. Because they're non-offensive. Dana Dane was an excellent storyteller. Big Daddy Kane had that proper lyrical flow. Slick Rick, bedtime stories. And I want you to think what happened with the music. I remember, remember the group Guy and Teddy Riley and the New Jack Swing when I remember this was a, a procedure. This was a community wide procedure. We would work Monday through Friday and Saturday would come and like Saturday, everybody would go out and wash their cars during the day. And then in the evenings, everyone would get dressed up to go to the club. And how did we dress? We dress like Guy. We dress like Big Daddy Kane. See, a lot of you keep pushing back on me and you're like, oh, no, 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 it ain't this. No. And what you're using is hood and ghetto. It isn't black culture. Black culture had a fundamental shift during the 90s because of the music. Because music is a very powerful and motivating force. I remember going to Macy's, buying this sweater, buying these dress pants, buying these shoes because I saw Teddy Riley wearing them. I feel I was like 20 years old. So music has a tremendous amount of influence and clout on culture. So we would like then get dressed up and we would go to the club and it was so different because we were different. One of the things that you guys have got to understand, and hopefully this global reset will bring some of that back because I, I just sit here and I'm, I'm thinking like, I remember when I was stationed at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii, we go to the club, we get dressed up right now. Over the last decade, clubs have had a problem with dress codes. It's like, cause folks want to come in there with their Air Force Ones, their jerseys, their hats, their braids. The, and the word that I'm looking for here is respectability. The respectability factor has just gone in the trash because the culture has shifted because I went back and I listened to, you know, Big Daddy Kane, uh, Dana Dane, uh, Slick Rick. I listened to some other rappers. And even when we start to go to gangster rap, if you listen to old Scarface, Scarface was a lyrical beast. There was more put into the music. There was more substance. There was more texture. There was more effort. There was more creativity that went into the music. And I feel that that effort, that creativity made the culture better. Right now, everybody wants to go ahead and make some beats on the little tablet, get some beats. It's just garbage. It's just junk. And with this cultural shift, toward what I call back, because I don't listen to it. I don't listen to new rap. I don't listen to, I don't know, I don't even know who any of these guys are. Um, you know, the only reason I know who Cardi B is is because for a moment she was everywhere. But this has been one of the most harmful cultural shifts in the history of black folks is that our music changed, our mores changed, our whole situation changed.
because I present this to you because you can go back and research it. You can go ahead and pull up any of these older rappers um, stories and listen to it. And the big shift started 1989, 1990, 1991, 92. This is when the big shift started. Remember New Jack City with Christopher Williams? Even though they were portraying drug dealers and stuff, they wore suits. They had a whole new different kind of attitude. And I feel that that shift of drugs in the black community being a simultaneous, a synonymous term. Because when we go back with the video, like I did that when we had class, black folks didn't mess with drugs. Black folks could be poor as a church mouse and they would be wearing clean press clothes, have a haircut and show up looking decent and respectable. And then we went from that to this trash culture. And, you know, people want to like, you know, I did a video about Reginald Lewis and people want to talk about his wife and what she did after he died. The man had brain cancer. He didn't try to die. He was taken from us far too soon. And what she did doesn't do anything to denigrate what he did. He built this. He created that money. And one of the things that, you know, with black folks and black culture is black folks are extremely sensitive to BS. Reginald Lewis was a black man that created a financial product that literally changed Wall Street. And this should be celebrated and recognized. Not, well, you know, he married a Filipino woman and she took care of the Philip. Cause see, here's the thing with that. The number of black men who are multimillionaires and billionaires is so small that this doesn't have an overall effect on the community. The facts are, most black men are married to black women. The majority, this, these are the stats. But the sensitivity, and this is part of the cultural shift. This is part of the get the bag mentality. This is part of the only fans world is people are looking at people's pockets and they're not looking at their accomplishments. They're not looking at the things that they've done. You know, I've shown you A.G. Gaston. I've shown you Alonzo Herndon. I showed you black men who became millionaires when black men were getting lynched. What's your excuse? Because, you know, I went historic because people want to go back and talk about what happened during World War II. And I will agree on some level that the things of the past impacted today. But you cannot name one government policy. You cannot name one racist policy in the last 40 years that have limited black folks. You can't name one. Yet people keep coming with Black Wall Street. They keep coming with Rosewood and all these other uh, romantic myths of black success. Well, Black Wall Street was a real thing. However, during this cultural shift and the, the, the push of respectability out of the community, I feel that we lost our cultural drive. Because go back to the 60s. Barry Gordy, Motown, Sam Cooke, black man who owned his own masters. I think that's what got him killed. If you go back and you look at the accomplishments of the successful, classy black people, you see it over and over again. They dressed a certain way. They wore their hair a certain way. They had a certain look. They had a certain way of carrying themselves. They, and that, in this cultural shift, got lost. And... I think part of that is one of the reasons where we are today, because I was watching this video, this ad by Wesley Billionaire Virgin, and there was this chick who was doing an ad for him, and she had the most ghetto nails. There is this 
lack of respectability. There's this lack, because you know, I saw it in the comments where people were talking about a Eurocentric. All right, let, let, let's just go ahead and talk about that. If you were born in the United States of America, you are an American. And guess what? That's your culture. Because the United States was a derivative of Europe. That's what it is. That's your culture. And this wholesale avoidance of trying not to be this way limits and reduces your chances for success. We were born in America. We are Americans. That is the American culture, which is a derivative of European culture. And you want to replace it because let, let's just go ahead and get real. How many people here know what tribe they came from, from Africa? Very few, very, very few people know. So you're trying to embrace a culture you know nothing about. Don't even know who your people were, which was a byproduct of racism and slavery. So you're trying to embrace something that you have no clue to what it's about. And also, this is what's funny. The richest black man in the world is a Nigerian. It's not an American. It's a Nigerian. And if you were to go to Africa, you would be looked, viewed and treated as an American, not as a African American. You would be looked, viewed as like, oh, you're an American. You just black. That's how you'll be treated because that's what you are. We are Americans. We're not Africans. Due to many bad, bad things happen, lineages, lines of culture were broken. And there's no way to put all this stuff back together again. So right now, I know this is going to be insulting to the hotel community, but your culture is a Eurocentric American culture because that's what you were born into. Now, if you choose to live a different way, if you choose to recognize another culture, that is your right. But I guarantee you, you will not be successful because you're not practicing American culture. See, American culture doesn't care, care who practices it. This is why immigrants are literally dying to get here. Because they know once they get here, they can do things that they cannot do in their country. I, I'm here to tell you, the black folks of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, they recognized that they were Americans. They wore suits, they dressed a certain way, they were respectable. During the worst period in history for black Americans. And once again, you are a black American. You're not an African American. I know that is hard to hear because for many years, because I remember when the shift, because I never went to African American. My name is Glendon. Because what term someone calls you mean is meaningless. Oh, you're African American. What, how much money does that put in your pocket? Zero. What about, oh, your name is Alan Jones and you created Alan Jones trucking and you have a fleet of 15 trucks and you created your own economic empire. Alan Jones is going to get more respect, more love than, hey, my name Pookie. I'm an African American. Where are the prizes? Where's the cookies? Where's the cake? Where's the punch? Ooh, you're African American. And this is one of the things that has happened for the longest, that the dominant black culture, which I've explained in many videos, has created and ushered this nomenclature of being called an African American with more energy, vigor, and gusto than they have about getting money. I want you to understand that. They went more effort into being called an African American than they went into the effort of creating, you know, the Booker T. Washington, Benjamin, Benjamin E. Mays, 
creating schools, building stuff, more effort went into this renaming of the people than in building resources, building businesses, building a vibrant economical culture, which would have changed how people are treated. The video I did talking about why black men need to start businesses. Yes, there are some racist cops. Yes, there are some racist people out there, but you start a business, you, you immediately change the game. You would go from being pookie them to Mr. Carter, Mr. Jones, Mr. Baldwin. You change the game because you, you, you agree a higher level respectable. Now, this is something that the dominant black culture has been saying for years. So what if you get money? So what if you buy a nice house in the white folks neighborhood? So what? You still gonna be treated like an inn. Now, this isn't true. I have lived that experience. I moved to a neighborhood. I've, I've not been called out my name, not one in 11 years I've been here. So I have not been treated like an inn. But why is the dominant black culture so afraid of financial success? Because I, when I moved here, I heard it. It's like, well, you know, they just go, it, it don't matter. You need to move to the south side of town, be with your people. I am with my people. I'm with my business owners. I'm with my people. Those, that's, my, that's my clan. The business owner click. I am with my people. We understand each other. We get down with the get down. What is this notion? Because there was someone who used to live over here. He moved to be around, quote, more black folks to feel comfortable. Feeling comfortable ain't going to change your lifestyle. And during the 2020 year, the murder hornet and the pandemic and all of these other things, I feel that we're going to start some new stuff because this is a global reset. And it is my heart's desire that this global reset resets the black culture. It exposes people to, you need to start a business. You need to be about enterprising. You need to be about the nation of Islam, about building respectability. Because the, the, the word for today, boys and girls, is respectability. And this is one of the biggest things that we lost during this cultural shift with the change of the music, change of the lyrics, change of the attitudes, change of the communities. So hopefully we will have a cultural shift that will go back to respectability because there is a civil war in the black community. There is the progressive blacks and the non-progressive blacks. I don't think that anyone is the N-word. I don't, I don't use that. That's a slippery, slippery slope. And the progressive blacks are waking up. They're like doing stuff differently. They're joining the Republican Party. They're making moves. And this, we're, we're gonna see where this cultural war goes because during this pandemic, a lot of people are going to suffer pain and pain produces change. People don't change unless it gets painful. You know, it's like as long as they can stay the way they are and get the results they're getting, they will stay that way. But when you introduce pain into the equation, things change and things are about to get very, very painful. Right now, we've got Congress on break and I don't feel that they're going to get anything approved before August. I, I just don't. And with this pain, and we have a wave of potential, we have a wave of like 20 million people who could be evicted. 20 million. That is a massive size of people. So hopefully this cultural change, this cultural shift, and this global reset meet together and we start producing a better culture because right now the dominant black culture is trash. It's just trash. I've shown you this in these videos 
of who we used to be when Ebony, John H. Johnson, Credit Jet, and you know, black people were respectable and hardworking and chasing the American dream and getting the American dream. This trash culture that we have, we gotta get rid of. And you know, it, it, cause it's harmful. It is not good for black folks. It's just not. So that's all I got for you guys. If you want to start your new economic culture because you are a black American and what is the American creed to be an American citizen? You gotta be corporate. This is something a lot of white people don't even recognize. To be an American, you got to practice the corporate game. You got to start a business. You got to have your own corporation. You got to have your holding company. You've got to have your baby subsidiaries. You, this, this is the American game. Look at who Congress took care of. They took care of their corporate citizens. Corporate citizens got trillion. The American people got 1.2 trillion. Look at the game and understand the game is going to be played in this manner going forward. It's not going to change. There is not going to be a big awakening for the people. It's not going to happen. So go below, get 30 days to 2,500. Go below, get the hustler's mindset, pimp your mind for success. And if you need help starting your business, I'm getting ready to do a lot of different things at financialselfdefense.com. This is the new platform. This is where ultimate money is. I'm getting ready to open up a whole lot of things and we're going to start having these business minded conversations. Not I'm fitting to, I'm shaping it up. I need to see people who are actually starting businesses, selling products, selling services. This is what the consulting services for because the consulting services are not because um, there is a financial tune up which can help any and everyone in the way that I'm building that ultimate money. But we need to start practicing being Americans, not Africans. Ooh, I know that was harsh to say because being African ain't going to put no money in your pocket. Practicing the American way will put plenty of money in your pocket. And there was recently a study that said money does buy happiness. Go figure. I've known that for years, you know, because you, you get people who are like money don't buy happiness. But I'm like, really? If you dying and you need a new heart and your new heart costs you a million dollars, and you got a million dollars. Not only did that new money buy you happiness, it bought you longer life. It's a foolish conversation that, you know, this is something that poor people tell themselves to make themselves feel comfortable about being poor. It's one of the craziest conversations, but that's what I got. All of the stuff's below and check out this next video.